Okay, so now that we're reasonably familiar with the real orthogonal groups, let's have a look now at their kind of complex counterparts, which are the unitary groups. So when we were working with the orthogonal groups, we saw that these were subsets now of some GL, the general linear group of all invertible n by n matrices with now real elements. But now these unitary groups are not going to be real elements, they're going to now have instead complex elements. And so rather than working with the group GLNR, we just work with its complex counterpart, which is GLNC, which is now just the n by n matrices, which are invertible, i.e. they have non-zero determinants, and now these are make these with now complex elements. So just as a note, we saw that this group GL, or rather the elements, with the n by n matrices, with well, however many entries. So this group, the general linear group, for the real case now we saw was just our n by n matrices and then we were able to view the matrix elements as essentially now the charts for this manifold. Each of the matrix elements essentially representing a copy of R is just our chart function that kind of maps the abstract group element into its concrete representation as the, the matrix of numbers and so we could view an n by n matrix is being isomorphic to the manifold R to the dimension N squared. So for example, if we have a two by two matrix, we essentially now have four coordinates, which are the matrix elements. And so as a manifold, this four by four matrix is isomorphic to R4. Okay, so now this is gonna be very much the same in the complex case, except now we need to remember that these A, B, C and D are now going to be complex numbers. And so really we need to remember that this complex number kind of has two real components, it's real and imaginary parts. Just expressing now the complex number as its real part and its imaginary part. And so a one-dimensional complex space is now effectively a two-dimensional real space because hopefully you're familiar with the idea that we can view a one-dimensional complex space as now being some kind of plane. We call it the complex plane. And we can just now realise that the one-dimensional complex plane is going to be isomorphic to a two-dimensional real space, i.e. the complex plane. And so we say that any complex number, which we usually give the name Z, is now going to just simply correspond to two now real numbers, which we realise as being the real and imaginary components of this complex number. And so we're going to be making quite frequent use of this fact that a one-dimensional complex space is now isomorphic to a two-dimensional real space. And this is going to be coming up quite a lot. But now what we should realize is that the, the matrix of these four complex elements is now going to be twice the dimension of our corresponding real matrix. And so the dimensionality of these GL elements is now not n squared, but rather 2n squared. So any m in GL and C 
it's going to have a dimension of 2 n squared. And so for this 2 by 2 complex matrix, this is now going to be an 8 dimensional real object. And just, we need to realise that this is because each of these complex numbers is really two real numbers. Okay, so this is just thing, things we need to keep in mind when we start talking now about complex Lie groups. We need to just remember that our complex or a one-dimensional complex number essentially is really a two-dimensional object or a two-dimensional real object. And this is going to come in quite heavily, as we're going to see shortly. But now let's just start introducing some of our complex groups. So as we had in the real case, of course, all the Lie groups we're going to be looking for are going to be able to be realised now as some subset of an appropriately large GL group. So now any other type of unitary group which we're going to consider are going to be a subgroup of this GL. Okay, so now let me just start introducing some of these groups. We'll start with the most simple unitary group, which is going to be the one-dimensional unitary group, U1. So if you just briefly remember back to our orthogonal case, we saw that the one-dimensional orthogonal group is basically so trivial it's not even worth considering because essentially O1 is basically just the real line of real numbers. Okay, so if you remember back now to how we first of all realised our orthogonal groups, we said that the orthogonal group, SON, any matrix, I'll just use M for a generic name, any matrix in this, or rather any group element now in the special orthogonal group, has to satisfy the orthogonality condition. This is how we define or realise the group elements. We essentially take the M's that are subs... We take any M in GL, and then we impose this restriction, and then that's going to restrict the possible matrices that we could have, and all the possible matrices are then going to correspond to the group SO of that appropriate dimension. So now we're going to do something very similar for our unitary groups. And so now I'm just going to give the general definition for any n-dimensional unitary group. I'm going to realise this now as being the set of all matrices which come from our now complex general linear group, and these matrices now have to satisfy the property that M dagger M is equal to the identity. So this is just defining now the unitary group of N dimension as the set of all matrices coming from GL and C that now satisfy something which looks quite similar to our orthogonality property, but we now realise this as being the unitarity property. So any two matrices we say are unitary if this thing M dagger times M is equal to the identity. So now what is this thing which I've defined? M dagger. Well, this is what we call the Hermitian conjugate. And you've probably seen this if you've taken anything to do with quantum mechanics. But now we define the Hermitian conjugate to simply be you take the matrix, you take its complex conjugate. Now I'm going to be denoting complex conjugates with an overbar. You sometimes see them denoted with a star, but mathematicians don't use the star notation because they reserve that for something else. They instead use an overbar. So this is just the complex conjugate now of this matrix M, and then you take its transpose, and that whole operation can just be written using this dagger symbol. We give it the name Hermitian conjugate. Hermitian conjugate. And so now any matrix that satisfies such a unitarity property is going to be a matrix in the 
group UN. So this is now our general definition, it's valid for all dimensions n. And of course we would expect now, this is the group UN, we could also then consider its special refinement to the group SUN, which is defined exactly as previously, the matrices have to satisfy unitarity, but they also have to satisfy the property that the determinant of the matrix is plus one. So this is the special refinement that we do to these groups. Remember we had for the orthogonal groups. Any orthogonal group is going to satisfy orthogonality, and then the special orthogonal groups are also going to satisfy unit determinant. So just mentioning that property for now is it's something we're going to be expecting to see shortly. And so just another brief comment. You can also then show quite easily that now the dimension of any unitary or the dimension of any UN matrix is then simply just going to be N squared. And then you can also show that the dimension of the SUN refinement is going to be n squared minus 1. So we'll see some examples of this shortly. But for now let's just go through and now start working out some examples of these unitary groups. We can take our general definition and start looking at the cases of different dimensions. <coughs> 